tonight, a special live edition of 2020. Please, over there. Come on. Work for me. America on edge. The ambush in Dallas. Don't shoot. Don't shoot. Tonight, a country reeling after a peaceful protest in Dallas turns into a deadly scene. Officers targeted and shot one by one. We got one officer down. One officer down. This was a well-planned, well-thought-out, evil tragedy. In a matter of minutes, five Dallas officers are dead, nine others wounded, including bystanders. Who were the fallen? The sniper telling SWAT teams he was aiming for whites. Did he use his training from the military? Tonight, a national conversation about race, about police relations, about gun violence. Officers shaken. This evening in several cities, told to head out in pairs. He's licensed to care. On Wednesday, a white policeman killing a black man at a traffic stop. Sir, he was just getting his license and registration, sir. A day earlier, another killed outside a Baton Rouge convenience store. <laughs> African-American parents telling their children how to react to the police. It could have been you. It could have been you. Are you? Are you? Cell phones and body cams now revealing a grainy, blurry narrative of fear on both sides. A special edition of 2020 begins now. And as we come on the air tonight, you are looking live at a makeshift memorial right here in downtown Dallas. Flowers and messages left on two police cars outside the police department here. As members of this community come out in support of the officers lost, we were at that tribute today, met a grandmother who was at that peaceful protest last night, but who also felt it was important to bring her grandsons to see those patrol cars to remember the officers who were fallen here in Dallas overnight. Good evening, everyone. I'm David Muir here in Dallas tonight. And I'm Elizabeth Vargas in New York. And we're here tonight live because of the events of the entire week. They have us all searching for answers. Two black men killed during what should have been routine encounters with police and then chaos and bloodshed in one man's violent retribution for those deaths. All day long, David's been on the ground in Dallas where developments have been fast moving. David? And Elizabeth, here's something that helps to put this in perspective. So far this year, the number of fatal shootings by police officers has risen over this time last year. But in the same period, so has the number of officers killed in the line of duty. Theirs is a dangerous job. And fear and outrage really on both sides seems to be fueling an endless cycle in this country, with many now demanding change. After a deliberate plot here in Dallas to kill police officers overnight, one by one. Flags and flowers for the fallen. Police cars covered in makeshift memorials. A city, sadly, in need of comfort. Deep in the broken heart of Texas tonight. A dark hour for Dallas. It all began at 7 o'clock last night. A large demonstration gathering in Below Garden, a park in downtown Dallas. No justice! No peace! No justice! No peace! Demanding change after police killed black men in Louisiana and Minnesota this week. For nearly two hours, everything running smoothly. Dallas police post photos and video on social media, handshakes and smiles with the protesters. The crowd estimated at 800, with 100 officers watching over. And then, just as darkness falls, you can see the moment when one protester realizes something had gone terribly wrong. And the peaceful march turns into a panicky scramble for safety. The first crack of gunfire. Some thought it was fireworks left over from the 4th of July earlier this week. Please, over there. Come on. It wasn't. Police radio broadcasting out the chilling warning. Shots fired, officer down. We got a guy with a long rifle. We don't know where the hell he's at. SWAT officers on floor two. They're taking fire with the uh, suspect shooting at police. The killing is not random. In the bullseye, the police. The shots fired from a parking garage at El Centro College. A gunman firing so rapidly, police at first mistakenly believe there are multiple shooters. Two snipers, at least two snipers, from elevated positions as the protest rally march ended, uh, began firing upon our officers, ambush style. 9.35 p.m., the first police officer reported killed. Five minutes later, two officers are down. This graphic and shocking video shows a man with a gun engaging an officer in a one-on-one -on -one gun battle. 
Another witness with a camera across the street captures this angle. The killer gunning down a policeman in cold blood. You can hear the anger, the outrage, the trauma in his voice. That bastard come out there shooting. He had an M16 or something with he had. He was the one doing the shooting. Get his ass. Taking his life into his hands, the man with the camera pursues the gunman, pointing him out to the other officers. He went over there by the school, by the school. He's over there at the school. The toll now, three officers dead, but the carnage is not over. At 11.13 p.m., police report a fourth officer has died. Shortly before midnight, police corner a suspect in the college parking garage. They negotiate. You see him? Right there. Let me zoom, zoom in. They got him. He said he was upset about the recent police shootings. The suspect said he was upset at white people. The suspect stated he wanted to kill white people, especially white officers. Negotiations break down. More gunfire. There's a sniper. He shot four cops. I'm not, you hear it. He's shooting right now. After so much bloodshed, police decide to end the standoff with an unusual tactic. We saw no other option but to use our bomb, bomb robot. A robot closing in on the suspect and detonating a bomb, killing him. Other options would have exposed our officers to grave danger. At 3.35 a.m., officials confirm the standoff is over. Just after four in the morning, President Obama, traveling overseas, speaks from Warsaw. As I told Mayor Rawlings, I believe that I speak for every single American when I say that we are horrified over these events and that we stand united with the people and the police department in Dallas. By sunrise this morning, officials raised the tragic toll. 12 officers shot, five dead. Two civilians were also wounded. This unforgettable image, police officers at Baylor Medical Center saluting the victims in blue. Finally, just before eight this morning, and many Americans are getting ready to go to work, the exhausted mayor and police chief of this stricken city sharing heartbreaking details of what happened on a night in July here in Dallas. We are heartbroken. It's a motorcade that in a moment will be getting ready to carry one of them. There are no words to describe they will head from the, the atrocity that occurred to, of course, Lord, to our city. See them to get to move now. We do not that first, a powerful image. And joining us here tonight is Byron Pitts, and it wasn't lost on either one of us here that overnight these were peaceful protests. Police officers weren't in riot gear, as we've seen in other cities across this country. Uh, they were here in, in normal clothing, and they've actually made great strides, progress, this police department here. David, last night you saw protesters and police officers taking pictures together. But tonight, the, the grief here is palpable. Lives changed and lives taken. Last night, five police officers in the city went to work, but never made it home. No justice! Before everything went so wrong, Shatamiga Taylor was thrilled to have her four sons along at the protest march. She had brought them to create a memory. She had no idea how unforgettable this night would end up. Once the shooting started. Go! They all began to run, scatter, and she said as she started to run, she caught a bullet in the back of her right leg. She immediately jumped on top of one of her boys, the 15-year-old. She jumped on top to cover him on the ground as she pushed him in between two cars on the curb. Her sister Teresa says Shatami had laid there for five minutes not realizing she was shot and not knowing where the other three boys went as she sheltered her son with her body. He was just scared. He didn't say much. When we walked into the hospital, he just grabbed our necks and hugged us. He's covered in his mom's blood. The family was reunited at the hospital, thankful the boys were okay. And Shatamia wasn't much worse. That's our youngest sister, and the only thing we can do is feel relief when we walk in and see it was just her leg. In fact, though she would require surgery, Shatamia was far more concerned with the fate of the police officers. We're watching the news in the hospital room, and all she can do is say, Lord, be with those families of those police officers. And that's what she kept repeating. That haunting video image of a deranged killer will not soon be forgotten. A total of five officers murdered, a motorcade taking bodies from the hospital to funeral homes. They were Senior Corporal Lauren Ayers, had been on the Dallas Police Force for 14 years, 55-year-old Sergeant Michael Smith, a father of two young girls and a one-time Army Ranger. 32-year-old officer Patrick Zimmeripa, 
husband and father of an infant daughter. He had survived three tours in Iraq. 40-year-old officer Michael Kroll, a native of Michigan. He had been on the Dallas force since 2007. And 43-year-old transit officer Brent Thompson, who had just gotten married two weeks ago. And it said on his LinkedIn profile, I'm constantly looking for different ways to serve the department. This is a family member of someone who has been shot tonight, I'm told. Let's listen. Seven in. others were injured, among them 39-year-old transit officer Misty McBride, mother of 10-year-old Hunter. Just happy that um, she was okay, that she can live on to tomorrow, and that um, I'm just glad that, she, that she's alive, really. I said that I love you, and that I'm glad you're here. McBride's father, Richard, was equally relieved. Shot in the arm, and it broke her shoulder. And she was shot in the abdomen, and it went in one side and just out the other side. Well, she's fine, but they said, you know, there's a lot of people a lot worse off than her. All of the survivors are expected to make a full recovery. And, Davey, that is, that is encouraging news in a night where there's so little in the city. We need the good news. Yeah. Byron, thank you. You know, you've talked to the families here. you talked to all of them. Uh, the families of the officers and they'll tell you that they know every day they fear that that phone call could come during their loved one shift and one of those families that got the call lost a son a brother a young father last night devoted to his baby girl tonight right here the family of patrick zamaripa he wanted to be a police officer since he was a little boy and his mother and his sister talked to me just a short time ago valerie and laura thank you so much for joining us uh, and of course our thoughts and prayers are with you tonight after the loss of Patrick, uh, your beloved brother uh, and your son. And Valerie, I know that your son wanted to be a police officer ever since he was a little boy. Tell us about it. Yes, ever since he was a little boy, he talked about becoming a police officer. And that was his dream. And he fulfilled his dream. Laura, do you remember your brother playing around the house, uh, pretending and hoping one day to, beat that officer, to be that officer? He got his jump start as being a military police in the Navy. You were the one who helped suggest to him that perhaps he should uh, join the military, and he, he became quite accomplished in special forces for the Navy. Yeah, I, um, he didn't have a plan, so I came home, and I said, well, let's go to MEPS, get you enlisted. You can be a military police, and that'll put you in the right direction. And sure enough, he ended up loving it. And Laura, do you remember when he came home and had decided to become a police officer back here at home in Texas? Yes, I do. Um, he was motivated, he was pumped, he was ready to go. And um, he got here and he did exactly what he was gonna say he was gonna do. He had the support of all of us and um, we backed him. We were so proud of him. I know that he often thought about his own children. They were his pride and joy, his stepson uh, and his little girl. And I read that he said when she arrived, Daddy's got your back, my new reason for life. How, how is Lincoln doing, and are you all thinking about her tonight? Oh, yes, most definitely. She's on our mind and in our prayers. Um, she's with her mother somewhere else right now. And um, how come they not be in our, our thoughts and prayers? And I just don't know how she's going to be looking for him and and not see him anymore. She I loves wonder. him. She loves her dad very much. Yes, she does. And she looks just like him. I heard as a father, he was uh, very much involved, often carrying his gear in one arm and the diaper bag in the other. <laughs> that was a for sure all the time when he would be getting ready to go to work. If he didn't have a sitter, he would call me and say, Mom, I got to drop off Lincoln. What would you say to the country tonight about uh, all of the police officers who put their lives on the line every day like your brother did and uh, your son did last night here in Dallas. To just be safe. Rely on your partners. Be safe. And support each other. What do you hope to carry on for him uh, in the eyes of his little girl that he loves so much? I'm not going to be able to do that on my own. <laughs> I need um, support from my mom and my dad and my other brother. That way she can know who her father was later when she grows up. Well, Laura, you have that support of, of your family right there in Fort Worth, I know, and the entire extended community here in Dallas. Our thoughts and prayers are with you, and we're thinking about Patrick tonight as well. Thank you both so much.
thank, thank you. you. Our thanks, our thanks to Laura and to Valerie tonight, and of course we're thinking about Patrick and all of those officers who were lost, Elizabeth. And as you heard from them right there, they're counting on their extended family and this entire community to really help raise that little girl. Very, very tough to hear from those families, David. Thanks. And we have so much more ahead tonight. More about that sniper, what he wanted, and the controversial action police used to take him down, and what has become the new normal for black families in America, having to talk to their sons on how to behave when stopped by a policeman. They call it the talk. And as we go to our break video just now with thousands marching in downtown Atlanta, coming face to face with the police, as the Georgia NAACP calls for a weekend of reflection and peaceful protest. We'll be right back. Back now with our live special edition and in London today, people marching for Black Lives Matter, one of three planned marches in the British capital. And we're back with tonight's special live edition. In a politically charged time just before two conventions in this presidential election, with outrage and fear across the country, we have some answers tonight on who the sniper was. But as you'll see, there are questions that may never be answered. Pierre Thomas is here now with more. Good evening, Pierre. Elizabeth, police say it was law enforcement's worst nightmare, a cold-blooded killer motivated by race targeting women and men because they wore the badge. Oh, Authorities say Micah Xavier Johnson went hunting for police, specifically white officers. He said he was upset about the recent police shootings. The suspect said he was upset at white people. The suspect stated he wanted to kill white people, especially white officers. According to police, that racial hatred ran deep. His Facebook page reveals some of that rage against police. He liked the page which said, kill everything blue that moves. Law enforcement sources tell ABC News Johnson was armed for his shooting spree with an assault rifle and two handguns. Today, police searching Johnson's home in Mesquite, Texas, finding bomb making materials, ballistic vests, rifles, and a personal journal of armed combat tactics. Johnson served in the Army Reserve from 2009 to 2015, doing a tour in Afghanistan. Neighbors in this quiet suburb of Dallas, where Johnson once attended high school, were stunned that the killer was living among them. This guy lived around the corner from me and was willing to take people's lives that he didn't even know. You know, it, it, it's scary. Another neighbor told us he recently saw Johnson doing what looked like tactical Army training in his backyard, crawling on the ground with a gun. But Micah's sister took to Facebook today to say that that was not the man she knew, writing, I keep saying it's not true. My eyes hurt from crying. At least two snipers from elevated positions as the protest rally march ended uh, began firing upon our officers, ambush style. Initially, police thought they had a suspect. A tweet from the public information office reads, All right, Dallas, we think this is one of our suspects. Help us find him. And by 12.30 Central Time, there was news that three suspects were in custody. At the same time, police were negotiating with a fourth suspect who turned out to be Johnson. The suspect has told our negotiators that uh, the end is coming and he's going to hurt and kill more of us. But early this morning, the one man they initially thought was a suspect had been cleared. The tweet read, this man cooperated, was interviewed, released. He is not a suspect, person of interest. And we received a phone call that my uh, face was on there as a suspect, and immediately I flagged down a police officer. Tonight, police increasingly believe the Dallas shooting spree is the work of a lone gunman. At this time, there appears to have been one gunman with no known links to or inspiration from any international terrorist organization. Those three alleged suspects arrested last night have been released, but authorities continue to look into Johnson's background to make sure he operated alone. Police praying Johnson was a lone wolf but taking no chances. Tonight they're going through his computers and phones to make sure there's no one else. Back to David in Dallas. All right, Pierre Thomas live in our Washington bureau tonight for this special 2020. Pierre, thank you. And we heard the mayor of Dallas today calling this a well-thought-out planned evil. 
So we want to bring in Martha Raddatz tonight because for the first time ever, the police, the SWAT team, in trying to communicate with this suspect, when communications broke down, they brought in a robot. And you have talked about these robots overseas, but what many people didn't realize was that in the major departments across this country, they have these robots. They do. In every large police department across the country and in many of the smaller ones. We've both seen them. They send those robots in for surveillance, for bomb disposal, and they'll put explosives on the arm of that robot, which is about the size of a lawnmower, a little bigger than the lawnmower. The explosives can be placed down if they fear a bomb is there, and they detonate the bomb before the bomb detonates itself. They put the explosives into the arm of the robot, but rarely, if ever, have we seen them actually use it when there's a suspect there to take out the suspect. We, we have never seen police departments, U.S. police departments, use this method, that they actually went in, they feel th threatened enough that they wanted to send that robot in. All right, Martha Rattis with us again tonight. Martha, thank you. And, you know, the marchers in Dallas uh, were reacting to recent events. Two black men shot by two different police departments this week, one in Baton Rouge and one in Minnesota. And, Elizabeth, this was all because of what began earlier in the week. That's right. On Wednesday, it was at a traffic stop. We were told in that live Facebook post it was all because of a broken taillight. And while traffic stops sound so routine to civilians, they are the single greatest cause of officer deaths across the country. There are two very different and dangerous realities faced by black drivers and the police. Here's Ryan Smith. I told him not to reach for it. I told him to get his hand out. A shocking fatal encounter with police during a traffic stop outside St. Paul, Minnesota. Hey, boss. Hey, boss. Another in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Just two high-profile, apparently unjustified shootings of black men that have left many African Americans frightened fearful of those who are sworn to serve and protect. It's like it's open season for African-American men. And traffic stops also claiming the lives of more police officers than any other police shootings. The belief that black Americans are at greater risk from police isn't just perception, it's reality. That's according to a study released just today that showed African-Americans are far more likely than other groups to be victims of use of force by police. It's not a, even a question of whether or not I think that they are treated, African Americans are treated differently. All of the data say that they are treated differently. That's a, that's a fact, right? That's not even an arguable point. Thoughts that were echoed by this Cleveland police officer when she posted on Facebook. Well, you got a God complex. You are afraid of people that don't look like you. On the other side of the equation, police officers around the country who have to patrol communities where they may be looked on with suspicion and hostility. A situation can turn from good to bad in a second. So you always have to look out for that. Officer Richard Palladino of Paramus, New Jersey knows this all too well, but focuses on his job. Some people trust the police, some people don't trust the police. It's all, I guess, based on your perceptions of them. Does that affect in any way the way that you do your job? No. You have to do your job the same every day. Do you fear for your safety when you get in a police car? No, I don't fear for my safety. It's not something I'm constantly thinking about. You do realize that it is a dangerous job, absolutely. Do you bring in any assumptions or any past beliefs about people when you do your job no. to try to assess the situation? No. I don't know that person most of the time. I don't know that person, so I, I can't judge them for something in the past if I don't know about their past. The tragic litany of questionable shootings and the community outrage that follows has led some police departments across the country to take a hard look at their policing tactics. The idea that you could have a training program that could reorient officers' sensibilities back to the nobility of the job and away from fear and self-preservation at all costs, that's, that's enormous. Ironically, in Dallas, the police department has led the way in retraining its officers using this reality-based training to attempt to de-escalate situations instead of coming in with a heavy hand. I want to brag just for a second for, for the, if anybody hasn't heard us say this. This police department trained in de-escalation uh, far be before cities across America did it, where we are one of the premier community uh, policing uh, cities in the country. And this year, we have the fewest police 
officer-related shootings in, than any large city in America. But all of that retraining will do little to ease suspicion of the police among many African Americans until they say fundamental issues are addressed. Why people of color seem to be dying at the hands of police officers at alarming rates. How to ease the fear of the police in communities of color. I do get a sense of fear and a sense of alertness that they're around me. And that's something you're not supposed to be feeling when a police officer comes into your area or enters your space. In the wake of the attack, officers in New Jersey have been urged to limit wearing police insignias and apparel while off duty. And while the country mourns the loss of the officers in Dallas, many hoping that deadly ambush doesn't overshadow discussions of how to resolve issues of mistrust between people of color and the officers that serve their communities. And those are such huge issues. And you've got to wonder about these officers. And we know that the leading cause of death for police officers, happen, they happen in traffic stops how quickly you must go from zero to 100 on the anxiety scale. You're, the officer you're with said he's not anxious, but clearly something goes like this. And I asked him about that, but what he said is he relies on his training, that he doesn't have that hair trigger sense to him because for him, it's rely on your training, focus on the job, don't have biases on people you don't know them. You simply go, you do your job, and that's the best way to keep safe. All right, Ryan Smith, a discussion that will continue across the country, I'm sure. And when our live special edition continues, a message from the woman who was at the center of the swirling events, that cool-headed woman who went live on Facebook seconds after the man she loved was shot by police in Minnesota in that traffic stop. We're back now with our live special edition of 2020 Ambush in Dallas. And as night is falling here in downtown Dallas on that impromptu memorial right there in front of the police headquarters, you can see there are two patrol cars there. And all day long, people from this community have been showing up with flowers, with letters. Families have written letters about the importance of the police officers protecting their communities and people embracing their tonight outside those cars. And photographers capturing the images for this community. It all comes after the events of this past week seeming to collide into a perfect storm of fear in many communities, fear about the injustices they've witnessed and fear for many of the officers out on the beat. One of the most chilling scenes this week has now been seen by millions when a young woman pulled out her phone and live streamed on Facebook for several minutes after a deadly police shooting. Her boyfriend had just been shot in the passenger seat right next to her. Her calm narration with the officer still standing at that window holding his gun left many speechless. ABC's Gio Benitez is in Minnesota. David, good evening to you. We are outside the governor's mansion here in Minnesota. And just take a look. So many demonstrators are still here tonight. They've been here since Wednesday night when this story went viral. Wednesday night, 9 p.m., two officers from the St. Anthony Police Department in Minnesota spot and pull over a white Oldsmobile. In that car, Diamond Reynolds with her boyfriend, Philando Castile, and her four-year-old daughter, Deanna. According to Reynolds, Castile told the officer he was carrying a licensed gun. He's licensed to carry. What happens next will further incite a country already in crisis. Officer Geronimo Yanez pulls his gun and begins firing at Castile. And Diamond makes the critical decision to grab grab her phone and start live streaming on Facebook. He was trying to get out his ID and he was reaching for his wallet and the officer just shot him in his arm. Reynolds calm and clear. Remember, her four-year-old daughter, Deanna, is in the back seat. Run back. Your hands I will, sir. No worries. I will. I told him not to reach for it. I told him to get his hand off it. He had, you told him to get his ID, sir, and his driver's license. Oh my God, please don't tell me he's dead. Then officers, guns drawn, order Reynolds out of the car and place her on the ground in handcuffs. Police perform CPR in Castile on the street, while Reynolds, now detained in a patrol car, finally breaks down. Her young daughter comforts her. Ah! It's okay, I'm right here with you. Within hours, this video goes viral, stirring outrage and protests across the nation. More than five million people viewing it on Facebook. And overnight, Diamond Reynolds becomes a symbol of the fractured relations between African Americans and law enforcement. 
these police are not here to protect no, and serve us. They are here to assassinate us. They are here to kill us because we are black. Thursday, Diamond getting a face-to-face -face apology from Minnesota's Governor Mark Dayton. I, I can't tell you how sorry I am for the terrible tragedy that's been forced on you and on your family. I don't want you guys to be sorry. I want y'all exactly. to be more careful. Even Facebook founder Mark Zuckerberg commenting about the power of sharing these graphic images on social media. While I hope we never have to see another video like Diamond's, it reminds us why coming together to build a more open and connected world is so important. It's become this flashpoint of renewing this conversation about police brutality, about uh, police fatal shootings, and the convergence of, of race and policing. So, but for the video, no one would be talking about it. Today, Diamond wants the world to know what her boyfriend, Philando, meant to her and to her daughter. He was very loving. He was a happy man. He went to work every day. They took him away from me. Now who's going to protect us? Philando Castile was 32, a beloved supervisor in a cafeteria at a Montessori school. He matters. His life makes a huge difference in this world, and now he's gone. It's not enough to protest. We have to find a way to change that. We have to make that change. A sentiment resonating far beyond Minnesota tonight. When you see what happened in Dallas, what's going through your mind? It hurts me what's going on in Dallas. Because nobody should have to be taken away from their families. My deepest, deepest condolences go out to those families and to those officers in Dallas. Because I'm here in Minnesota and I'm mourning for the loss and the loved one of my family members. So I know that those people in Dallas are hurting. Hurting like the four-year-old little girl who comforted her mom in the midst of such horror. How's your little girl doing? We're just going to try to keep her as energetic and let her embrace her child life. Today, she graduated from preschool with the man she loved not there to cheer her on. And back out here live in Minnesota, we should tell you that the county attorney here is still deciding whether he'll use a grand jury to determine if charges should be brought against these officers. Elizabeth. All right, Gio, that video was absolutely searing. It has been almost two years since Michael Brown was shot and killed by a police officer in St. Louis. The Black Lives Matter movement has protested again and again. Lawmakers have grieved with families. Body cams have become a byword in policing. But as our nation struggles to overcome racism, many are asking, has anything changed? It is a citizen army of iPhones that has ignited shock and anger at what really happens in the streets between police officers and the people. Eric Garner, suspected of illegally selling cigarettes, fought and died after being placed under chokehold during his arrest. When Eric Garner was choked, brought down, and really killed on video, that struck a chord with not only the African-American community, but the American community. Despite that video, officers were never indicted. But the white-hot spotlight of publicity did ignite a movement as protesters across the country railed against police brutality against African Americans. It didn't stop there. One month later, 18-year-old Michael Brown was shot and killed by police officer Darren Wilson in a street in Ferguson, Missouri. Soon, protesters and police were squaring off in violent confrontations as the city burned. His shooting was found to be justified. The grand jury decision not to indict Officer Darren Wilson. Hands up! Don't shoot! Hands up! And protests were heard around the world, from city streets to LeBron James on the courts. That's why we walk through Ferguson with our hands up. To John Legend in common at the Oscars. We see you, we love you, and march on. God bless you. Yet, despite the glare of publicity and the frustration of a black American president... We need to recognize that this is not just an issue for Ferguson. This is an issue for America. 
America continues to be confronted with African Americans dying at the hands of police. Tamir Rice, Walter Scott, Freddie Gray. Is it an epidemic or are we just finally seeing what has been happening all along? If you talk to a lot of people, this is simply an exposing of what has always happened. According to the Washington Post, out of thousands of police shootings since 2005, only 54 officers have been charged. I think, though, that things are getting better because if you look in the past 18 months, there have been um, more charges brought against officers in, in these shootings than ever before. And so I think now with the sort of ubiquity of camera phones everywhere, we will see a change. We will see officers being held more accountable. And yet, this past week, as the graphic videos of police violence play out for the nation to see, the difficult questions are front and center once again. How far have we come? What more must we do? questions to be debated in the coming days and we'll be back in a moment with a look at what very few white families have had to deal with what what families of color call the talk when we return and you're looking at flags flying across the country half mast in honor of all the victims this week We're back now with our live special edition of 2020 and the national discussion about race causing so many difficult conversations this week, a divide between black and white. And for many, that divide means preparing their own children for what could be different circumstances when their children come in contact with the police. Our ABC colleagues were talking about it today, as perhaps some of you at home. Sunny Hostin sat down with her friend, author Lawrence Otis Graham, for an unfiltered talk about having the talk about appearance and perception. Let's talk about the uniform. I didn't know until Trayvon Martin got shot that the hoodie was something that children, black children, shouldn't wear. And I remember when my son was about nine, I felt that he needed a uniform right. so that he didn't right. appear to be threatening. So right. he always has khakis on, a, a polo shirt. No, okay. So you spoke to ABC a few years ago about this uniform that we both have our children wearing. It's no hoodies, it's no dark clothes. My boys know that they've got to be khaki pants. We don't do sweatshirts with words and names on them. This is really casual for them. They don't do the t-shirt thing. Has the uniform changed? Um, the uniform has actually become more, a little more conservative. There's no sunglasses, hoodless sweatshirts. I like haven't the done the no bonds. sunglasses oh, yet. Oh, but we, we've, we've got it nailed down. I mean, it's topsider shoes, you know, the boat mm -hmm. shoes. Now, all of this seems outrageous and ridiculous, but this is the cultural shorthand that strangers need to be able to see to say, okay, this kid's okay, this kid is safe. We have a whole list of rules that my kids first resisted, but now very much understand. Parents of all races should probably have this discussion with their children, how to survive a police encounter. But the bottom line is the stats don't lie, right? I mean, if you look at the stats, black children, young African-American men, are more likely to be killed by police officers than their white counterparts. I would love to have raised my children telling them it's a colorblind society, but um, that's a fairy tale because ultimately they are going to get profiled, whether, and it's out of their control. Now, what about this notion that, you know, when you have the conversation, the conversation with your children about race and policing, that you are having a biased conversation? and um, you're racist, and you're part of the problem for making your children distrust police. Right. And in our family, our view is, and I'm saying this as someone who's chair of the county police in my local police, mm -hmm. um, and I know how hard they work, and I know how dangerous their job is. And most of them are wearing that uniform because they want to help people Absolutely. and because they're just good cops. And they are not looking at race, they're not looking at gender, not looking at ethnicity, but for me and say, Mom, I gotta drop off Lincoln. What would you say to the country tonight about uh, all of the police officers who put their lives on the line every day like your brother did and uh, your son did last night here in Dallas. To just be safe, rely on your partners, be safe, and support each other. What do you hope to carry on for him uh, in the eyes of his little girl that he loves so much? I'm not gonna be able to do that on my own. Oh. 
I need um, support from my mom and my dad and my other brother. That way she can know who her father was later when she grows up. Well, Laura, you have that support of, of your family right there in Fort Worth, I know, and the entire extended community here in Dallas. Yeah, our thoughts and prayers are with you, and, and we're thinking about Patrick tonight as well. Thank you both so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Our thanks, our thanks to Laura and to Valerie tonight. And of course, we're thinking about Patrick and all of those officers who were lost, Elizabeth. And as you heard from them right there, they're counting on their extended family and this entire community to really help raise that little girl. Very, very tough to hear from those families, David. Thanks. And we have so much more ahead tonight. More about that sniper, what he wanted, and the controversial action police used to take him down. Litany of questionable shootings and the community outrage that follows has led some police departments across the country to take a hard look at their policing tactics. The idea that you could have a training program that could reorient officers' sensibilities back to the nobility of the job and away from fear and self-preservation at all costs, that's, that's enormous. Ironically, in Dallas, the police department has led the way in retraining its officers using this reality-based training to attempt to de-escalate situations instead of coming in with a heavy hand. I want to brag just for a second for, for the, if anybody hasn't heard us say this. This police department trained in de-escalation de far be, before cities across America did it, where we are one of the premier community uh, policing uh, cities in the country and this year we have the fewest police officer related shootings in than any large city in America but all of that retraining will do little to ease suspicion of the police among many African Americans until they say fundamental issues are addressed why people of color seem to be dying at the hands of police officers at alarming rates how to ease the fear of the police in communities of St. Louis. The Black Lives Matter movement has protested again and again. Lawmakers have grieved with families. Body cams have become a byword in policing. But as our nation struggles to overcome racism, many are asking, has anything changed? It is a citizen army of iPhones that has ignited shock and anger at what really happens in the streets between police officers and the people. Eric Garner, suspected of illegally selling cigarettes, fought and died after being placed under chokehold during his arrest. When Eric Garner was choked, brought down, and really killed on video, that struck a chord with not only the African-American community, but the American community. Despite that video, officers were never indicted. But the white-hot spotlight of publicity did ignite a movement as protesters across the country railed against police brutality against African Americans. It didn't stop there. One month later, 18-year-old Michael Brown was shot and killed by police officer Darren Wilson in a street in Ferguson, Missouri. Soon, protesters and police were squaring off in violent confrontations as the city... ...hoping that deadly ambush doesn't overshadow discussions of how to resolve issues of mistrust between people of color and the officers that serve their communities. And those are such huge issues. And you've got to wonder about these officers. We know that the leading cause of death for police officers happens... They happen in traffic stops. How quickly you must go from zero to 100 on the anxiety scale. You're, the officer you're with said he's not anxious. But clearly, something goes like this. And I asked him about that. But what he said is he relies on his training, that he doesn't have that hair trigger sense to him. Because for him, it's rely on your training, focus on the job, don't have biases on people you don't know them. You simply go, you do your job, and that's the best way to keep safe. All right, Ryan Smith, a discussion that will continue across the country, I'm sure. And when our live special edition continues, a message from the woman who was at the center of the swirling events, that cool-headed woman who went live on Facebook seconds after the man she loved was shot by police in Minnesota in that traffic stop.
We're back now with our live special edition of 2020 Ambush in Dallas. And as night is falling here in downtown Dallas on that impromptu memorial right there in front of the police headquarters, you can see there are two patrol cars there. What's going on in Dallas? Because nobody should have to be taken away from their families. My deepest, deepest condolences go out to those families and to those officers in Dallas. Because I'm here in Minnesota and I'm mourning for the loss and the loved one of my family members. So I know that those people in Dallas are hurting. Hurting like the four-year-old little girl who comforted her mom in the midst of such horror. How's your little girl doing? We're just going to try to keep her as energetic and let her embrace her child life. Today, she graduated from preschool with the man she loved not there to cheer her on. And back out here live in Minnesota, we should tell you that the county attorney here is still deciding whether he'll use a grand jury to determine if charges should be brought against these officers. Elizabeth. All right, Gia, that video was absolutely searing. It has been almost two years since Michael Brown was shot and killed by a police officer in St. Louis. The Black Lives Matter movement has protested again and again. Lawmakers have grieved with families. Body cams have become a byword in policing. But as our nation struggles to overcome racism, many are asking, has anything changed? It is a citizen army of iPhone. Led the way in retraining its officers, using this reality-based training to attempt to de-escalate situations instead of coming in with a heavy hand. I want to brag just for a second, for, for the, if anybody hasn't heard us say this. This police department trained in de-escalation uh, far be before cities across America did it, where we are one of the premier community uh, policing uh, cities in the country. And this year, we have the fewest police officer related shootings in, than any large city in America. But all of that retraining will do little to ease suspicion of the police among many African Americans until they say fundamental issues are addressed. Why people of color seem to be dying at the hands of police officers at alarming rates. How to ease the fear of the police in communities of color. I do get a sense of fear and a sense of alertness that they're around me. And that's something you're not supposed to be feeling when a police officer comes into your area or enters your space. In the wake of the attack, officers in New Jersey have been urged to limit wearing police insignias and apparel while off duty. And while the country mourns the loss of the officers in Dallas, many hoping that deadly ambush doesn't overshadow discussions of how to resolve issues of mistrust between people of color. A transit officer, Misty McBride mother of 10 year old hunter just happy that um she was okay that she can live on to tomorrow and that um i'm just glad that she that she's alive really i said that i love you and that i'm glad you're here mcbride's father richard was equally relieved got in the arm and it broke her shoulder and she was shot in the abdomen and it went in one side and just out the other side well, she's yeah. fine but they said you know there's a lot of people a lot worse off than her All of the survivors are expected to make a full recovery. And Davey, that is, that is encouraging news in a night where there's so little in the city. We need the good news, yeah. Byron. Thank you. You know, you've talked to the families here. you talked to all of them, uh, the families of the officers, and they'll tell you that they know every day they fear that that phone call could come during their loved one shift. And one of those families that got the call lost a son, a brother, a young father last night, devoted to his baby girl. Tonight, right here, the family of Patrick Zamaripa. He wanted to be a police officer since he was a little boy. And his mother and his sister talked to me just a short time ago. Valerie and Laura, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, and of course, our thoughts and prayers are with you tonight after the loss of Patrick, uh, your beloved brother uh, and your son. And Valerie, I know that your son wanted to be a police officer ever since he was a little boy. Tell us about it. Yes, ever since he was a little boy, he talked about becoming a police officer. 
And that was Byron Pitts, and it wasn't lost on either one of us here that overnight these were peaceful protests. Police officers weren't in riot gear, as we've seen in other cities across this country. Uh, they were here in, in normal clothing, and they've actually made great strides, progress, this police department here. David, last night you saw protesters and police officers taking pictures together. But tonight, the, the grief here is palpable. Lives changed and lives taken. Last night, five police officers in the city went to work, but never made it home. No justice! Before everything went so wrong, Shatamiga Taylor was thrilled to have her four sons along at the protest march. She had brought them to create a memory. She had no idea how unforgettable this night would end up. Once the shooting started. They all began to run, scatter, and she said as she started to run, she caught a bullet in the back of her right leg. She immediately jumped on top of one of her boys, the 15-year-old. She jumped on top to cover him on the ground as she pushed him in between two cars on the curb. Her sister Teresa says Shatami had laid there for five minutes not realizing she was shot and not knowing where the other three boys went as she sheltered her son with her body. He was just scared. He didn't say much. When we walked into the hospital, he just grabbed our necks and hugged us. He's covered in his mom's blood. The family was reunited at the hospital, thankful the boys were okay, and Shatamia wasn't much worse. That's our youngest sister. And heard to our city. That burst of powerful image. Joining us here tonight is Byron Pitts, and it wasn't lost on either one of us here that overnight these were peaceful protests. Police officers weren't in riot gear, as we've seen in other cities across this country. Uh, they were here in, in normal clothing, and they've actually made great strides, progress, this police department here. David, last night you saw protesters and police officers taking pictures together. But tonight, the, the grief here is palpable. Lives changed and lives taken. Last night, five police officers in the city went to work, but never made it home. No justice! Before everything went so wrong, Shatamiga Taylor was thrilled to have her four sons along at the protest march. She had brought them to create a memory. She had no idea how unforgettable this night would end up. Once the shooting started. They all began to run, scatter, and she said as she started to run, she caught a bullet in the back of her right leg. She immediately jumped on top of one of her boys, the 15-year-old. She jumped on top to cover him on the ground as she pushed him in between two cars on the curb. Her sister Teresa says Shatami had laid there for five minutes not realizing she was shot and not knowing where the other three boys went as she sheltered her son with her body. He was just scared. He didn't say much. When we walked into the hospital, he just grabbed our necks and hugged us. He's covered in his mom's blood. The family was re- We're back now with our live special edition of 2020 Ambush in Dallas. And as night is falling here in downtown Dallas on that impromptu memorial right there in front of the police headquarters, you can see there are two patrol cars there. And all day long, people from this community have been showing up with flowers, with letters. Families have written letters about the importance of the police officers protecting their communities and people embracing their tonight outside those cars and photographers capturing the images for this community. It all comes after the events of this past week seeming to collide into a perfect storm of fear in many communities, fear about the injustices they've witnessed and fear for many of the officers out on the beat. One of the most chilling scenes this week has now been seen by millions when a young woman pulled out her phone and live streamed on Facebook for several minutes after a deadly police shooting. Her boyfriend had just been shot in the passenger seat right next to her. Her calm narration with the officer still standing at that window holding his gun left many speechless. ABC's Gio Benitez is in Minnesota. David, good evening to you. We are outside the governor's mansion here in Minnesota. And just take a look. So many demonstrators are still here tonight. They've been here since Wednesday night when this story went viral. Wednesday night, 9 p.m. is in the back seat. We're back. Your hands with him. I will, sir. No worries. I will. I told him not to reach for it. I told him to get his hand off it. He had, you told him to get his ID, sir, and his driver's license. Oh, my God. Please don't tell me he's dead. Then officers, guns drawn, order Reynolds out of the car and place her on the ground in handcuffs. Police perform CPR in Castile on the street, while Reynolds, now detained in a patrol car, finally breaks down. Her young daughter comforts her. Ah! It's okay, I'm not here with 
channel. Within hours, this video goes viral, stirring outrage and protests across the nation. More than five million people viewing it on Facebook. And overnight, Diamond Reynolds becomes a symbol of the fractured relations between African Americans and law enforcement. These police are not here to protect and serve us. They are here to assassinate us. They are here to kill us because we are black. Thursday, Diamond getting a face-to-face -face apology from Minnesota's Governor Mark Dayton. I, I can't tell you how sorry I am. The yes, terrible tragedy that's been on you and on your family. I don't want you guys to be sorry. I want y'all exactly. to be more careful. Even Facebook founder Mark Zuckerberg commenting about the power of sharing these graphic images on social media. While I hope we never have to see another video like Diamond's, it reminds us why coming together to build a more open and connected world is so important. It's become this flashpoint of renewing heartbroken it's a motorcade that in a moment will be getting ready to carry one of the there are no words to describe they will head from the, the atrocity that occurred to, of course, Lord, to our city see them to get to move now. We do not at first a powerful image and joining us here tonight is byron pitts and it wasn't lost on either one of us here that overnight these were peaceful protests police officers weren't in riot gear as we've seen in other cities across this country uh, they were here in, in normal clothing and they've actually made great strides progress this police department here david last night you saw protesters and police officers taking pictures together but tonight, the, the grief here is palpable. Lives changed and lives taken. Last night, five police officers in the city went to work, but never made it home. No justice! Before everything went so wrong, Shatamiga Taylor was thrilled to have her four sons along at the protest march. She had brought them to create a memory. She had no idea how unforgettable this night would end up. Once the shooting started. Go! They all began to run, scatter, and she said as she started to run, she caught a bullet in the back of her right leg. She immediately jumped on top of one of her boys, the 15-year-old. She jumped on top to cover him on the ground as she pushed him in between two cars on the curb. Her sister Teresa says Shatami had laid there for five minutes not realizing she was shot and not knowing where the other three boys went.